Today we have very good news for you, and we're here excited to share that news with you. You're going to hear from uh, U.S. Attorney for the District of Oregon, Amanda Marshall, from the Mayor of the City of Portland, Sam Adams, from the Chief of the Portland Police Bureau, Mike Reese, and from Commissioner Amanda Fritz. They'll, of course, take questions uh, at the end, and we have a report that we'll hand out to you at the conclusion of the press conference. So with that, I'd like to introduce Amanda Marshall. Thank you. Um, thank all of you for coming today. Uh, thank you, Mayor Adams, Chief Reese, and your whole team, uh, the City Attorney's Office and your whole team, uh, and the Civil Rights Department at the Oregon De or at the Oregon Department of Justice. I've been here a year. i got to remember I'm a Fed now. Um, at the United States Department of Justice for all of their help in coming to uh, what we believe is going to be a historic uh, agreement between the City of Portland and the United States. Um, first, the, I want to just say, and I know it goes without saying, but I but I want to say it anyway, that the vast majority of the city's police officers are honorable law enforcement professionals who risk their physical safety and well-being every day for the good of the public. We enter into this agreement to ensure that the Police Bureau delivers services to the people of Portland in a manner that effectively supports officer and public safety and complies with the Constitution and the laws of the United States. This agreement is targeted to strengthen initiatives already begun by the Portland Police Bureau to ensure that encounters between police and persons with perceived or actual mental illness or who are experiencing a mental health crisis do not result in unnecessary or excessive force. We recognize that the Portland Police Bureau has endeavored to adopt components of modern management despite being a very lean organization comparatively to other cities the size of Portland. And we greatly appreciate the city's commitment to provide Portland Police Bureau the fiscal support necessary and to rapidly and fully implement a state-of-the-art management and accountability system. The ability of police officers to protect the community they serve is inextricable from the relationship that they have with this community. And I want to particularly thank community members, uh, the groups that have given input to this process of, as we've moved forward. Uh, the input has been invaluable and has really informed the agreement that we have reached today. Uh, the community participated in two separate telephone calls that were hosted by the Department of Justice. Um, and I can tell you all that, that that input really did help us to shape this agreement. I also want to recognize the private sector uh, for coming to the table and being partners with the city uh, and the Department of Justice in moving forward to implement not only the reforms that we're going to that are going to affect Portland Police Bureau, uh, but also that are going to lead the way uh, for the way the state of Oregon and potentially the nation as a whole move forward in implementing progressive health care reforms. I want to now just get into the nuts and bolts and some of the specifics and the highlights of the agreement. The first part is about enforcement and monitoring of the agreement. A compliance officer and community liaison will be the independent authority for the overall monitoring and implementation of the agreement. Also, the Department of Justice will continue to monitor through review of reports submitted by this liaison. Selection of the liaison will occur through a city process which will identify three candidates for this position with expertise in police practices, community engagement, and crisis intervention methods. A public comment period will be open on the three candidates and City Council will make the final selection. The liaison will collect and synthesize PPB's use of force data and provide quarterly public reports on implementation of the agreement and will oversee the Community Oversight and Advisory Board. There will be public comment period for all liaison reports. The PPB will hire or retain a compliance coordinator for the duration of the agreement. The coordinator will be the liaison between the Police Bureau and the Department of Justice and the liaison. The coordinator will facilitate the collection of data, documents, and access to Portland Police Bureau personnel. Portland Police Bureau must revise or develop policy, protocol, and training consistent with this agreement, which the DOJ and the liaison will review prior to the Portland Police Bureau implementation of such policy. Upon approval of City Council, the agreement will be filed in Federal District Court pursuant to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 41A2 with a conditional dismissal of the complaint with prejudice subject to the court retaining jurisdiction in order to enforce the terms of the agreement. The United States and the City of Portland are the only parties to the lawsuit. 
The agreement provides for public <coughs> input and comment throughout the implementation of the agreement, and specifically on use of force. The Portland Police Bureau will revise its use of force policies to comply with the Constitution with greater emphasis on de-escalation tactics and will take into account the subject's mental state before any use of force. Portland Police Bureau will avoid or minimize the use of force against people with actual or perceived mental illness or who are experiencing a mental health crisis. And for tasers, only one taser will be used on a subject at a time. Officers shall attempt to effect handcuffing between each taser cycle. Portland Police Bureau has initiated on-site supervisory investigations of uses of force and documentation of those investigations. Supervisors must in immediately notify the Professional Standards Division regarding all serious uses of force and uses of force against people with actual or perceived mental illness or who are suffering from mental health crisis. Portland Police Bureau's inspector, in conjunction with the liaison, will audit officer force reports and supervisory reports quarterly to ensure compliance with the standards set forth in the agreement and detect trends in officer use of force. And specifically for training, the training division will conduct a needs assessment regarding misconduct complaints and problematic uses of force. Portland Police Bureau will develop guidelines to govern its selection of officers as trainers and ensure that those officers do not have a history of using excessive force. In fact, we agreed to ban as trainers any officers with sustained force complaints. Community-based uh, mental health services establishes city's efforts with collective care organizations. This has to do with the implementation of the reforms that are related to the broader-based issue of people with mental health crisis in Oregon. Uh, the CCOs are being developed with county and state regarding mental health services. Cur the current plan is for the city and the CCO here in Portland to have a committee to expand community mental health as part of the Affordable Care Act health care transformation in 2013. Portland Police Bureau has agreed to adopt the Memphis Model Crisis Intervention team of specially trained officers with 24-hour availability. Portland Police Bureau has agreed to expand its mobile crisis units from one to three uh, cars and each car will be will have a both a specially trained Portland Police Bureau officer and a mental health professional. Portland Police Bureau will continue to train all officers on basic crisis intervention techniques, and the city's 911 agency will train all dispatchers on crisis triage. An advisory committee, including mental health activists, advocates, and consumers, will help form policies and trainings for each new effort. Portland Police will use early intervention system not only for single officers, but also for supervisors and units. Portland Police will add triggers for early intervention system review based on percentage of arrest in which force officers used and peer comparisons of force use. The city has agreed to complete internal affairs investigations within 180 days, down from the current one plus year time frame. The city is required to develop a Garrity policy for on-scene interviews of witnesses, officers, and non-compelled voluntary on-scene interviews of officers who use force. This policy will be subject to DOJ approval and review. A member of the citizen review panel is added to the police review board, the group that, rep that recommends discipline and force investigations. Portland police must act on use of force that give rise to findings of civil liability in every case. We have created a community oversight advisory board responsible for participating in the oversight of the agreement and developing a community engagement and outreach plan. The board will have 15 voting members. Five members will be selected by city council, five human rights commissioners, and five voting members selected by the community at large. There will be five Portland Police Bureau officers who will participate in this board, but those officers will be participating in an advisory capacity and will not have authority to vote. This board is not wholly new, but is a reformation of another community board with new community membership, and it now provides a mechanism for selection for community members to the board and relies upon existing units for outreach rather than creating a new unit. 
In closing, I want to say how much I appreciate the effort and expertise that the current Portland Police Bureau leadership have brought to this process. They have contributed to the investigation, the agreement, and the ongoing reform process in a way that without their agreement, we would never be standing here today. The community, the continuity of management and effort that has been made will ensure that we are successful in the future as we move forward to implement all of the reforms that have been out that have been outlined here today. Thank you for your time. I'm Sam Adams, uh, Mayor and Police Commissioner. I want to start by thanking the uh, folks at the U.S. Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney General for the State of Oregon, uh, Amanda Marshall. I also want to thank the uh, Portland Police Bureau, the leadership of Chief Reese um, and all the hardworking folks there. I also want to thank the community that stood uh, with uh, Commissioner Saltzman and I in 2009 uh, to call for a review by the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. And at the time, Commissioner Saltzman and I were very clear that we opened the doors for the U.S. Department of Justice to look for any bias and that if there was opportunities for improvement, even without bias, that we were interested in their input. A year later, after the shooting of Aaron Campbell, just days later, uh, they opened, announced that they were opening up, opening up that review. Most of you were here uh, two months ago uh, when the announcement of those findings uh, were made. And now today, we are uh, announcing the proposed settlement agreement. Uh, this agreement is going to make the Portland Police Bureau better. We are going to learn the best practices as it relates to dealing with folks that are perceived or are suffering from mental illness. We are going to learn the best practices at de-escalation techniques. We are going to be accountable for the performance uh, like we have never been made accountable before. As you will see when you get a copy of this, there, there are not only um, uh, citizen oversight to determine whether or not this agreement is being met, but it also requires uh, independent, independent inspectors and auditors uh, in this uh, effort uh, to improve. Um, the cost of this proposal uh, when you include the continued $2 million um, funding for the service coordination team um, is about uh, $3 million, about $3.3 million. Uh, we have been working full time, nearly full time it feels like, on uh, coming up with uh, this uh, proposed settlement agreement. So I can preemptively answer your question, no, I have not figured out yet how to pay for it, but we will. Uh, first, we had to get the agreement settled. Um, you will note that 23 of uh, the total of 31 new uh, FTEs, 23 are civilian. It includes significant increases in staffing to the independent police review function and also to internal investigation. It also includes, as I mentioned, uh, civilians who have will have independent um, uh, independent authority at review um, along the way as well. Uh, with, and there are more details, and, and the uh, U.S. Attorney went over them. For me, this is a water, for me, this is a watershed moment for the City of Portland, for the Portland Police Bureau, but also the Fire Bureau and 911, our first responders. We are fully embracing the responsibility that we have and the realities that we face when it comes to uh, dealing with folks that are perceived or suffering from mental illness. And we have in this agreement the ability to do much better and to be best in class in this nation um, on, uh, on that very difficult issue. But there's something more that has been accomplished in this agreement with the support of the U.S. Department of Justice. We've embraced the totality and the reality of our role of being part of the mental health care system locally. But we've also been embraced by the health care system and the emerging 
health care reforms um, in a way that will provide the kinds of resources to folks that we encounter suffering from mental illness and through the efforts of the governor and the president that health care reform uh, will do a lot of good and with our integration into it uh, we're going to be able to improve the lives and save a lot of lives. Um, finally, I want to mention that the, an important part of this agreement that we embrace is no matter what your view of uh, the police, um, the police's uh, relationship uh, with Portlanders, but especially Portlanders of color, this agreement, with this agreement, we embrace the fact that we have to have better relationships with Portlanders of color. Um, that is an important part of this agreement that you'll see, and there are some very aggressive requirements of us uh, to do exactly that. Um, I, I, I've asked uh, Commissioner Fritz uh, to say a few words. She worked with me and local hospitals and uh, CCO and Multnomah County to really, you'll see an entire section on uh, community-based mental health services, and she was instrumental in helping me on that, so I'd like Commissioner Fritz to talk about that. Good afternoon. It's clear that while the county and the state are principally responsible for mental health care services, the police are often first responders dispatched by the Bureau of Emergency Communications, which I oversee. For three years, I've been working with our community partners, including Multnomah County, Cascadia Behavioral Health Care, Central City Concern, LifeWorks, area hospitals, people with lived experience with mental illness and their advocates, and others to work towards a system of care that provides appropriate and sufficient services to people with mental illnesses in Portland. Some of this work through the Safer PDX project, formerly known as the Bazelon Project, resulted in my recommendations for improvements to our regional system of crisis and community health care, which I shared with the Mayor and the United States Department of Justice earlier this year. The City's agreement with the Department of Justice <coughs> confirms the need for many changes in our city. The agreement cites the absence of a comprehensive community mental he health infrastructure often shifts to law enforcement agencies throughout Oregon the burden of being first responders to individuals in mental health crisis. I agree. It's a burden. It's also an opportunity. This is the reality in which we must operate, and we must, we must improve the outcomes for people experiencing mental illnesses. Having a core group of officers who choose to receive supplemental training and are dispatched to all 911 calls related to people with mental illnesses in partnership with mental health care providers is a valuable step in the right direction. The ability for Portland police officers and qualified mental health professionals to work together on crisis prevention for folks who our offices interact with frequently will help connect those who need mental health care services with appropriate treatment and careful, principled collaboration about individuals whose police officers come into contact with will help us and our partners more effectively treat the most vulnerable people in our community. I am particularly hopeful that we can begin implementing many of these changes called for in our crisis and community mental health care systems as we begin the partnership with the regional coordinated care organizations and Multnomah County. It's a historic opportunity to fix the system. In the agreement, the Department of Justice states its expectation that the regional coordinated care organizations will establish by mid-2013 one or more drop-off centers for first responders and public walk-in centers for individuals with indiv addictions or be behavioral health care needs. The city will work closely with crisis and community health care providers to pursue the establishment of this service. We will also focus on Im how emergency departments in hospitals, community clinics, and urgent care facilities will admit highly, highly acute individuals immediately and focus care plans on appropriate discharge and community-based treatment options. The agreement notes that the city will participate on the mental health and addiction work groups of the coordinated care organizations as well as review county requests for proposals for contracts on those services to pursue the following improvements to the system. Increased sharing of information between agencies and organizations, including the Bureau of Emergency Communications, Multnomah County, and health care providers to create an information exchange amongst first responders and providers to better serve people experiencing mental illnesses. We've already started some of these as a pilot project and it already is creating better outcomes. 
We will create rapid access clinics so that people in crisis have access to timely appointments for treatment and medications. We will enhance access to primary care providers for low acuity patients, creating more capacity for acute patients in the existing outpatient crisis mental health care system. And we will pursue expanding options and available capacity for the Bureau of Emergency Communication op Operators to appropriately divert calls to qualified civilian mental health care providers as first responders. As you know, we've already started this program, and the new number for people feeling suicidal or for those who are concerned about people feeling suicidal is 503-97-23456. That's 503-97-23456. That will get help with Lines for Life, formerly Oregon Partnership, mental health care professionals and volunteers who will spend as long as it takes talking and counseling with folks on the phone. In the past year, they handled over 19,000 calls, <coughs> and 98% of those were uh, resolved on the phone without the need to dispatch anybody. We will continue expanding networks of peer-provided services, such as the NAMI North Star and Folk Time uh, programs. And we will address other unmet needs identified by the Safer PDX project and its community partners. I will continue to work to support the implementation of these provisions of the agreement. I believe they help strengthen our system of care. I will also engage with the Office of Neighborhood Involvement and the Office of Equity and Human Rights in the community oversight processes. The ongoing work must be transparent and accountable to everyone in the community. Before the, uh, before the chief comes up, I just want to also thank Auditor uh, Griffin Vallee for the great work that uh, she has done um, over the years to help uh, reinforce the independent uh, police review process. And would you like to say a few words? Just very briefly. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, I should say. I'm LaVon, LaVon Griffin Vallade. I'm the Portland City Auditor. Um, since 2010, the Independent Police Review Division in my office has become a more proactive civilian oversight agency. At that time, we sought various city code changes that were ultimately approved by city council. Today, pending council action, I am pleased to say that this agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice will enhance those improvements through even stronger accountability measures. Just a couple of highlights. The most important of the accountability measures addressed in the agreement is timeliness of investigations. Investigations will need to be wrapped up in 180 days. There will no longer be years-long investigations that end up eroding public trust and system accountability. The agreement calls for guidelines to bring about consistency and police officer discipline. This will help ensure that discipline decisions are clear to officers and meted out fairly. Finally, as Mayor Adams noted, IPR will now have a greater role in timeliness of investigations. We will be seeking more investigators in IPR. I am committed to greater diversity on our team. And I am also committed to hiring at least one new investigator with a background and experience in the field of mental health. I think that's important for all the work uh, throughout IPR, and uh, I'm extremely committed to that and di having greater diversity in our office. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. You betcha. Uh, thanks as well to the Office of the City Attorney who um, worked uh, long hours to um, help us develop these programs with the Portland Police Bureau and be able to present them uh, to the U.S. Department of Justice for their consideration um, as well. Um, and I just want to underscore one thing that Commissioner uh, Fritz mentioned. Uh, health care reform um, had uh, the health care reform effort, what we call the CCO, um, was looking to uh, initiate improvements in the community-based health care system in about 18 to 24 months. So the fact that they are willing to move up that piece of health care reform to mid-2013 uh, uh, was in, was absolutely um, worthy of uh, highlighting and uh, on behalf of a grateful city I want to thank them. Um, that will help uh, make sure 
that as we improve in the police bureau that folks that are suffering from mental illness will get improved care um, and and treatment uh, police chief Mike Reese well the mayor is right this is a watershed event today and uh, today's agreement with the Department of Justice is a positive step forward in assisting the city the bureau and the community in developing improvements to how we meet the needs of people in crisis. As police officers, we embrace our role in these changes and the challenges we face in difficult circumstances every day. You know, much has changed in public safety in the past 20 years. Officers today repeatedly respond to people in crisis who are facing homelessness, drug addiction, and mental health issues. For us to be effective, we need to be partners with the health care system, not just the criminal justice system. There are no easy solutions or guaranteed outcomes to the complex problems that we face. We all agree that we can do better as a police bureau and as a community. This agreement will provide us a roadmap as we move forward. I really think this is a unique opportunity for us as a bureau and as a community. Um, you know, the fact that the mayor was able to bring together health care providers and uh, CEOs of hospitals to the same table with uh, law enforcement and our partners uh, speaks volumes about the commitment everybody has in this community to uh, make changes in how we deal with people in crisis. It uh, has been uh, tough at times to look internally at the situations that we face and to have that critical eye uh, focused on the police bureau, but I think it's a sign of a healthy organization that we are willing to meet these challenges, that we are uh, moving forward, that the agreement, as I said, provides us a roadmap to do that, and we look forward to uh, working with our community partners. Thank you. And with that, we'll open it up to questions. If you could indicate who you'd like to ask the question of, and uh, who would like to begin. Yes, over here. Question sure. for the Mayor and Mr. Chief Reese. There were some reductions in internal affairs recently. Can you outline what the net, net gain or loss is? Uh, there is one reduction um, in internal affairs. A civilian position is part of uh, my efforts to maintain sworn positions, so that it was a reduction of one. The net gain then with these positions? Uh, be a net gain of? We're adding five uh, investigators as well as uh, other uh, administrative staff to help process the investigations faster. Mike Benner? And we'll, we'll, pa we'll be passing out um, the spreadsheet that shows money and where it's at. <clears throat> This is for the mayor or the chief, and obviously it's hard to answer this with 100% confidence, but had these practices been in place in the years leading up to now, do you think they would have saved the lives of people like James Chassie and Aaron Campbell and everyone else? Um, everyone else, that last part. <laughs> yeah. um, 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 choice of words, but the other... It's, a, it's an observation, only a personal observation, and I think that, uh, yes, we would have saved lives, more lives, <clears throat> and we would have... Uh, reduced injuries, um, more importantly with this overall improvement to the mental health system, those people would most likely, once this is all up and running, wouldn't be on the street facing such difficult times to begin with. So that's what I like about this approach and you won't find this in other agreements across the country is we are dealing, we, we are committing ourselves and the resources to improve our city services. At the same time, our partners have come together with the urging of uh, the United States Department of Justice following up on their work in the state mental health system to say we're also going to improve the care of these individuals. And now the police bureau is considered, as is the fire bureau and 911, part of the treatment and the care for folks that are suffering mental health. Max? Can you describe the process to reach this agreement, how this was hammered out between police, city, and mental health providers? I'll take, I'll take that one. Um, I had the, I had 
the opportunity to participate in both uh, this agreement and the agreement with the state, which I think was really important, um, as did Adrian Brown from my office and uh, representatives from the civil rights team from the or from uh, D.C. And I think that was really important for the reasons that were stated by Mayor Adams, which is that this is a problem in Portland that has to do with excessive use of force of the police, but it's also a part of a much larger uh, problem in the state of Oregon that has to do with the failure of adult mental, mil mentally ill. And I think that perspective helped to inform the way that we move forward in this process. Community engagement was incredibly important. Uh, and that engagement happened both at the level um, at, at many different levels uh, with the mental health community, with other communities in Portland, um, and also uh, across the state. Um, and so both of those investigations, I think, helped to inform each other. Um, but the process for settlement uh, really started um, as part of the investigation. Uh, I mean, and that's not to say we were involved in settlement discussions during the investigation, but what I mean by that is that uh, the city of Portland, unlike other cities around the country uh, in similar circumstances, was incredibly open, transparent, and very quickly came to the table to say, uh, we want to be a part of the solution. And we did not uh, end up spending a lot of time, uh, for example, litigating over discovery, um, but instead were able to move very swiftly to compile the information information that we needed that led to the findings. Um, the next piece of uh, the settlement was once the findings were delivered to the city uh, was the speed with which um, the city attorney's office, the mayor's office, and uh, Chief Reese's <coughs> office again came to the table and said, as, you know, as long as you people are all in town, how about we start settlement negotiations now? And again, that's different than what than sort of the posture that these investigations have taken in other parts of the country. And that really led to just that, which was folks from the Civil Rights Division, uh, myself and my team from my office, the city attorney's office, Chief Reese's office, I mean, literally clearing the books and sitting in a room for the next two or three days uh, to hammer out what became the skeleton framework for what the agreement looks like today. Um, that was when we were able to then hold the press conference to inform uh, the community with where we were at. Um, and then in the weeks that have followed, uh, we've continued to meet both personally and by phone with members of the community. And by we, I mean the, the Department of Justice representatives to get input. Simultaneously, the city's been having similar meetings, um, not only with the city, with the community leaders, but also with the private sector. Um, I was very pleased to be invited by the mayor, uh, I don't know, was it this week, mayor? <laughs> uh, for the past weeks, yeah, yeah to uh, to meet with uh, members of the um, of the private sector that represented hospitals um, and uh, folks from the state from um, OHA to again sit around the table and figure out what their involvement can be. So I think it's really been a coalition of uh, both private and public, state and federal partnerships, um, and just the incredible willingness um, and openness and work and effort and energy that's been poured into this process. Process uh, that has gotten us to where we are today. One, I, just to, I would only add to that, and one reason that one one motivating reason why I stood with community leaders and Commissioner Saltzman to call for the investigation is if if they found imperfection and if they found violations of constitutional <coughs> rights. Also, what comes with that then is their access across the nation and beyond to best practices. There have been a lot of reforms in these particular efforts over the years, um, and there's been a lot of suggestions, you know, I don't know if they're competing, but not always consistent suggestions mm -hmm. on what mm -hmm. other reforms should be. This process made it very clear what are the reforms we're going to commit ourselves to and fund ourselves uh, to meet some specific performance expectations. Maybe one more question. Yes. Go ahead. I want Mr. Lehman's Coalition for Justice and Police Reform, and I'm here representing Dr. T. Allen and Dr. Lauren Hayes. And um, we are going to be looking at this very carefully. And I think just based on what I heard here, there may still be some questions and concerns that the community has. And knowing that there's a process that's been ongoing even since the, the conference calls and people haven't been engaged and just keeping being informed about what was going on during this, this process. 
um, is a concern. And I just want to say, and I probably shouldn't have to say this, but community engagement is critical. Our communities across this state want to continue to have confidence where it's warranted, improvements where it's needed, and we need to be part of that as partners. And so as, as this begins to roll out, you know, having the monitor, having the opportunity to interact with the monitor, provide feedback, it's so critical. Often we, we come to these decisions and then, you know, once we get rolling down the road, um, all of a sudden things begin to fall apart. So I'm just challenging everybody in this room, we can't let it fall apart because lives are at stake. Okay. If, if I could, I, uh, uh, Ms. Harris, um, that's why we're also passing out, uh, um, that's why it's important that this also have the appropriate funding behind it with the appropriate staffing to allow for uh, the continued involvement. And you'll, you'll see when it rolls out, there are, are new uh, citizen-based advisory committees at a couple of very important levels. Um, but that staffing, being able to have that independent staff and having that independent mo staff available to the community is the, the price tag on this. Um, these are tough budget times, so this is not an inconsequential amount of money, but it is worth the investment. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This concludes today's press conference, and there's an opportunity for individual interviews now. Thank you. Who's passing it out? Uh, Dave Warborough. Dave Warborough in the back has the agreement.